the most categorically legitimate longing of human beings is the longing to be free. That is what self-determination is about at its core. Aloha mai kako. I'm Kapua Alasprot, a law professor and the director of Kahuli'ao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law at the William S. Richardson School of Law here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. It is my great honor and privilege to sit down and to talk story, as we say here in Hawaii, with my dear friend, my brother, and a personal hero, Julian Uggen, a fellow Richardson alum who is back in Hawaii this week to give a talk for our Better Tomorrow speaker series. In the realm of social change, Julian is a triple threat. He sings, he writes, he litigates, and in no particular order, because he kills it at all three. He is the founder of Blue Ocean Law, an innovative litigation firm that takes a holistic and human rights-based approach to the practice of law. At Blue Ocean, they embrace a grassroots orientation that privileges civil society and marginalized voices. Julian is an accomplished essayist, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and the author of this widely praised, lyrical and lovely book, No Country for Eight Spot Butterflies. He is a champion of his own Chamorro people in Guam and of indigenous people across Mauna Nui'a Kea, the Pacific, our blue continent. He is a sensation and an inspiration and it is an honor to have him here with us today. Julian, aloha and velina. Aloha, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here in this space and to be in conversation with you. Yeah, definitely after all these years. So many years. So I wanna talk a bit about Maui and the climate emergency. You write so movingly about the existential threat of climate change that has already arrived to low-lying coastal communities across Mauna Nui'a Kea, our Pacific. And in the aftermath of the fires in Lahaina in particular, mm. we too <clears throat> see with tragic clarity the climate emergency that's really enveloping us. And honestly, with little hopes of escape or survival. So you use words to fight and heal, Julian, but what words do you have for us this evening? The first two that come to mind are community and solidarity. I, I just think, I think the first thing that we have to do in sort of our various engagements with the climate crisis is essentially to stop functioning as individuals. You know, neoliberalism, as they say, has conned us all into thinking we can combat climate change as individuals, That's as right. atomized individuals, and we simply cannot do that. Mm -hmm. We have to do it in community with each other. I mean, and that is exactly what I saw in the aftermath of the fires at Lahaina. I saw so many people come out. I mean, both in Maui, but everywhere, throughout mm -hmm. Hawaii, through Guam. I participate participated myself in like a Books for Maui event that like a small collective of, I think mostly Pacific, Pacifica women sort of rallied around and there were so many events like that. That gives me hope. Um, the sort of the togetherness of mm -hmm. it all, the solidarity mm -hmm. of that. And just putting it into practice and realizing that solidarity is a verb, you know, it is action. Right. Um, and that just locking arms with each other Mm -hmm. And sort of being in it together is the only way to effectively engage the climate crisis. I totally agree with you. Um, and in many ways, even though we're so <clears throat> far apart, <clears throat> I feel like in the work that each of us do, we're locking arms um, with respect to the climate issue and so many other sure. things. So words and stories matter so much to both of us. And you write about their importance to movements for social change. Mm -hmm. Why do successful movements need effective storytellers? Wow, this is such a great question. Um, well, uh, social movements have always needed, you know, their writers mm -hmm. and their artists, their musicians. It's not just writers, but just artists in general, because artists sort of more than any, anyone else, they are capable of reminding us who we were, mm -hmm. who we are, and who we can still be. Okay. You know, they have a sort of real gift for operationalizing 
that you know a lot of the sort of hard ideas right. the tough stuff they have really com tough conversations and a right. lot of the conversations around the climate crisis are incredibly difficult to have you know like for example i i'm going to talk a lot um tomorrow night during the talk um about sort of various communities throughout oceania that are now faced with a very existential question that is whether right. or not um, their version of adaptation mm -hmm. to the adverse effects of climate change really includes mass relocation, right. you know, and so for so many Pacific Island communities, that is not the case. Right. They're like adamantly, vehemently opposed to mass relocation. But right. you have um, so many other sort of actors on the world stage, like international institutions who are like more or less effectively encouraging mass location as an option, right. arguably because adaptation in place might be too expensive. So it's just it's it's these are really tough conversations to have. And lawyers, you know, we have a very important function, right. you know, very important role to play. But it's not the occupation that has the most emancipatory vision, for sure. <laughs> Artists do right. have that vision. They see what we cannot, you know? Right. Poets see what we cannot, you know? And they gift us the language with which to fight back. That is why I'm always in praise of activists and artists. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think they, you know, it's really these storytellers that help to inspire us. And I think exactly as you said, help us to remember not just who we were, but who we can be again, and perhaps who we must be mm. in order to rise to meet this challenge. Mm -hmm. um, what story can you share with us this evening that will help us <clears throat> to rise to meet the demands of this historical moment? <laughs> wow, these questions are big. <laughs> um, uh, honestly, I would s actually say it's a story that's really close to home because um, at my firm, Blue Ocean Law, we are currently serving as lead counsel Right. to the Republic of Vanuatu, which is currently pursuing an advisory opinion on climate change mm -hmm. and human rights, the nexus between right. climate change on the one hand and human rights on the other. And they're seeking that advisory opinion from the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, right. also known as the International Court of Justice, also known as the nice. World Court. Mm -hmm. So essentially we are taking the climate crisis to the World Court and we're asking a very epic question of that court. We're asking the court to pronounce upon what are the legal obligations for states with respect to anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the conduct that's right. causing the climate crisis. And we're also asking what are the legal consequences for states which or who by their acts or omissions, you know, have caused significant harm to the climate right. system. And, you know, th these are really epic questions because we're not actually following the mold, we're breaking the mold. We're not actually right. asking a narrow legal question. A narrow legal question, for instance, would be what are the obligations of all countries under the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement framework, for example? Right. We're not asking that question. We already know sort of the answer to that right. by virtue of the sort of how little has been achieved with the COP process, that right. multilateral negotiation process year after year. You know, we have pronouncements, but we don't have actual emissions coming down. Right. So what we're asking the court to do instead is to survey a much wider corpus or body of mm -hmm. international law to pounce upon the sort right. of international legal rules that could be and should be brought to bear on the climate crisis, which includes international human rights law, right. as well as a whole host of norms under general international law, which right. includes the right to self-determination, which for Pacific Island countries in particular is paramount. Absolutely. You know, and I feel like we here in Hawaii, um, because of the important restorative justice underpinnings of our laws, mm actually need to look more <clears throat> to these, the human rights principles of self-determination, not as hard rules per se or as hard laws, but really as values that mm. help us to interpret the, um, the laws that we have in place, especially with respect to traditional customary native Hawaiian <clears throat> rights, for example. That, that's, in, that's so true. I mean, for example, the passage of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007, that is now sort of the governing standard. It's, it, it allows states to interpret, right. you know, their already binding legal obligations, but with this new lens, you know, and that's the lens that there is a right to free prior and informed consent. You know, especially over large scale development activities that threaten to interrupt indigenous peoples in the exercise of our fundamental rights. So I see that you do that all the time. I mean, you did it in your very recent law article. You operationalize self-determination, which is a norm, right. which in some ways can, at least to, an, to a non-legal audience, might seem a little nebulous. Mm -hmm. But you break it down and you sort of apply it in a really 
specific set of contexts, for example, with regard to water rights. Mm -hmm. So I see you and I see the work that you're doing over here and I totally commend it, applaud it and you know, stand with you because we're trying to do the same thing. We understand that the law as a tool or as an institution mm -hmm. um, is not necessarily about justice, yeah. but sometimes it can be. So we are trying to push it to be more often. I think we're involved in the same project. Absolutely, we see the potential <clears throat> for justice, but we understand, especially here in Hawaii, <clears throat> that often what we call the black letter law, right? What the law is on the books is definitely not how it rolls out on the ground and in the community. And that's why it's absolutely essential for us to have these analytical frameworks or other mechanisms to be able to operationalize these otherwise um, nebulous concepts, right? We have to make them real so that people can hold on to them mm. and understand what they actually mean. Um, and what I find in looking at self-determination issues and these, these international human rights principles of self-determination <coughs> here in Hawaii is that they're actually rooted at bottom in indigenous principles, things like aloha aina. And that's, a, that's at bottom, that is absolutely what it comes down to. I, I agree with that too. Obviously, we're gonna agree with each other a lot <laughs> on this little program, so, but um, I think that's fine. I think that's right. I think indigenous peoples, especially so many Pacific Island indigenous sort of legal frameworks, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, we have a language. In some ways, our language, uh, we have a much more capacious ability to capture the reality on the ground. You know, for example, space is relational. So we have a very easy concept for a relational space. Mm -hmm. So many oceanic cultures do, yes. you know? And it just, what I love about sort of invoking indigenous like mm -hmm. language and cultural values, mm -hmm. and then if you eventually dress it up as law or not, okay. what, what I love about them is they, they just show how paltry sort of Western analytical frameworks that are on offer, how paltry right. they really are, right. because their terms like environment and nature are so flat. Right. Yeah. And that's where the artistry, I think, in the songwriting and all of that needs to come into play, right? To give it some color and some flavor. And texture. Absolutely. We yeah. need more texture to our law and to our values and, and to all of it. You know, your book is so political, but it's also <coughs> incredibly personal. And to me, it really reads like a love letter mm. to your Aina and to your people. And so you really recreate heartbreaking moments, you know, on one page your petulant child demanding candy, right, from your father as he lays dying. And pages later, you're wondering, uh, you're wandering the neighborhood, crying out for your father who's abandoned you and your ohana in death. And so why is intimacy, I guess, and vulnerability so important? Again, I love your questions. I love how thoughtful they are because they really, so they're interrogating the book and I really appreciate being met like that. That's what the book is trying to do. Like, I mean, it is very, it's risking a lot in some mm. ways because it is so almost it's spectacularly personal. Um, and I sort of reveal comfortably incredibly vulnerable moments in my life, including when my father died when I was nine years old. He died of pancreatic cancer and my nuclear family fell to pieces and sort of that process. But I realized, I sort of realized um, in the process of writing just how important that is just and how political an act you know like sharing one's grief can really be i mean i, I said that this this morning but i this morning i was thinking about angela davis who said walls turn sideways are bridges mm. and grief can be the same yeah. you like grief so often has an isolating effect it's like a wall that's thrown up between you and everyone around you but actually if we turn it over you know, it can be a bridge and we can mm. use our grief and our broken heartedness mm. to make a crossing, right. to find each other again, not just find ourselves, but find each other. And I think that is incredibly beautiful, but also functionally incredibly political right. because that's, that's how we grow a global heart. We let it break first into hundreds of pieces. Well, and that's, and I appreciate and really applaud um, your courage and putting yourself out there, right? To be deeply honest, because I think you have to be um, in order, well, I mean, you have to be willing to let it all fall apart so that you can put it together again. Yeah. So mahalo for that. I wanna talk a little bit of, about your time here in Hawaii. Mm. I wanted to focus on the book, but I feel like, um, I feel like with this book and your earlier books as well, that I see pieces <coughs> of that from your time here in Hawaii. So you were a student here with us at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And um, how would your time with us at Richardson and with Kahuliao in particular, I would say, prepare you for the work that you're doing today? 
so advocacy, yeah. litigation, art, all, all of it. All of it, all of it. <laughs> Kuhulia was like a really sort of formative place, you know? It was like a home for activist students, like activist lawyers or would-be activist lawyers. Um, speaking of teachers, you were one of them, you know, Susan, another, there's Linda Krieger, there's so many. <clears throat> but the reason why I appreciate, looking back especially, it's so acute for me, you know, what I what I appreciate from Kuhuliao and that experience, it was just, it was clear that you understood what all activist lawyers need to understand to act effectively in the world. That is, that the law is always already a moving train. Right. And as Howard Zinn would say, we yeah. cannot be neutral on those things. Yeah. So that's, it was useful. It was exceedingly practical. Mm -hmm. It was concrete. Once I understood it, like it's like the lights went on, you know? Mm -hmm. And I understood that the law is limited. It's a limited tool, but it's still a tool. And on occasion, it be it can be very powerful. So I was like, that's what I saw you all doing. You understand. I mean, you, even your work at Earth Justice, like we all are who are social change lawyers. You know, we all sort of play in the sandbox and we understand <laughs> that even the doctrinal limitations, we understand how the law has uh, developed sort of mischievously throughout mm -hmm. history like we we understand all of that yet we are still able to muster up the wherewithal and the sort of like meticulousness and the sort of like intellectual athleticism necessary to do a good job Absolutely. like we try to deploy law in service of vulnerable communities that's what i'm i've devoted right. my entire practice to doing a blue ocean law and you know i see so many other activist groups and activist like entities that are doing the law in this very particular way and i just see family i mm -hmm. see us all engaged in the use and deployment of law in the same way for the same ends and i can appreciate that absolutely the community yeah that you mentioned exactly. earlier right? it's definitely community kuhulia was that for me in law school during my time at Richardson, because you know, the law school also attracts two types of people. On the one hand, it attracts um, people who wish to, to use the law, uh, primarily for the private accumulation of obscene amounts of wealth and power. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other kind of law student who goes to law to do what we're trying to do, which is to really use it in service of the vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, and I feel like the social change, I mean, the transformative and restorative justice work that you do is so important and I think it takes a different kind of approach a different kind of lawyering um, and I'm excited about the potential and what I see happening um, not just at Richardson but in the work that you're doing because I think in many ways you're emblematic of the potential that we have for our students who can do things differently especially I think for indigenous students our students from marginalized communities who um, can turn the law transform the law into the tool that they need it to be yeah not just the one that's handed to them oh yeah and so, um, so thank you for that, <laughs> Julian. Um, speaking of the law and your important and transformational work, I want to talk a little bit about Davis versus Guam. <laughs> I remember the day so well <coughs> when you argued um, before the Ninth Circuit panel at the law school. I helped you fix your tie. But I, <laughs> but I feel like you were born for that moment, right? For you... Um, as an indigenous Chamorro man to be arguing this case about the self-determination of your people. I mean, this is this whole thing was made for you and you did it in your own way on your own terms. And so can you share a little bit about that case and what it meant to you in all of the good and bad ways? Ah, sure. Okay, I'm gonna try to do this in a really condensed version, but still lay out the sort of fundamental facts right. and law. Okay, Guam is recognized by the international community formally as a non-self-governing territory or right. colony um, that is awaiting of a true exercise of the right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. What that means from an international perspective is that we get to choose between one of th at least three internationally recognized political status options, which may be, uh, you know, you know them. But one of them is outright independence, right? So we have this fundamental right of self-determination. Then we have the Guam legislature, which decades after its creation, mm -hmm. essentially passed a local law, a Guam statute, that provided that anyone who was like made a U.S. citizen in 1950, you know, um, that's when the U.S. government right. passed the Guam Organic Act of 1950, conferring U.S. citizenship on that group of people for the first time in history. Mm -hmm. And as part of that pro process, 
recognize that the native inhabitants of Guam were a colonized polity, right. you know, that had these rights that needed to be sorted out. All the Guam legislature did was add three words, and their descendants. Because essentially, we, if, we, if the Guam legislature had failed to do that, we would have sort of rewarded the colonizer for just waiting for everyone to die out because the colonized class would have collapsed because so many of the people who made citizens have already passed on. So we simply added a use of a descent category. So we use ancestry, right? So we add that and we said, as long as you descend from someone who was colonized and recognized by the US Congress as such, you are entitled to these decolonization rights. One of them is you get to express your vote right. by way of a symbolic, and I mean purely symbolic, non-binding political status website at which you would get to register your wishes mm -hmm. for your your desired political future with the U.S. In 2011, um, a former um, stateside resident, I think a former U.S. Air Force officer, moved to Guam. I mean, sued, he had earlier moved to Guam and sued based on the theory that to deny, to only, that the Guam statute was unconstitutional under the 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution because it, it used ancestry as a proxy for race, which it argued um, was illegal under the 2000, uh, uh, the year 2000, the de ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court in Rice versus Cayetano, which affected your people, right? right? So essentially, in that case, I'm sorry this is a long, no. but I think it's maybe helpful for the audience to really sort of unpack some of this. Right. And we don't teach enough con law classes so we can really do this. Right. We need to teach more. Um, but essentially, um, the plaintiff's lawyer, Davis, Arnold Davis's lawyer, argued that all of that, that this Guam statute violated the 14th and 15th Amendments, and he took dicta, granted sweeping dicta, mm -hmm. from, a, from the Rice versus Cayetano decision, and that was this, quote, ancestry can be a proxy for race. And they said, just by virtue of having those three words and their descendants, just by virtue of that use of an ancestral classification, that itself is race. Mm -hmm. So essentially, he took the Rice versus Cayetano holding too far right. because the court didn't actually say that ancestry is race. It could have easily said A is B, but it did not. It said right. A can be B sometimes right. Right. if you deduce enough discriminatory intent. Mm -hmm. So that was the heart of the case, right? It was an intent case. Right. And so under the 14th and 15th Amendments, and we argued the hell out of it for, right. it was like almost 10, a decade of my life. I mean, ultimately we did not, we did not win. Mm -hmm. um, and largely because the US, uh, the Ninth Circuit mm -hmm. for, felt compelled by the Rice versus Cayetano decision. Although it did differentiate it a little, said the ancestry sometimes isn't race. In this right. case, maybe it's too close. The Guam legislature was too close to Hawaii legislature right. when it passed its challenge statute. So that's what the case was about, legally speaking. But personally, right. it just shows me the absolute inadequacy mm -hmm. of the sort of prevailing legal frameworks, right. in particular, race jurisprudence in this country right. and its inability to accommodate certain kinds of historical fact patterns, right. and that is colonization. Right. Colonized peoples, the very act, what, why this case is so dangerous is because the very act of designating who constitutes a colonized class right. in the court's eyes is that very act collapses axiomatically into a racial categorization, right. which is forbidden under the 15th Amendment. Right. That's what's so scary, but even deeper than that, I think what's truly troublesome as a student and scholar of the law mm -hmm. is that what are we what are we doing here? Look, right. who are the plaintiffs? Right. Like who's winning? I was like, wow, this is what's happening in a nutshell. People coming forward who have never historically been in need of any constitu extra constitutional <laughs> protection right. are now benefiting. They're the new beneficiaries right. of these sort of reconstruction era amendments to the right. US Constitution, which were only created precisely because the only people allowed certain rights, i.e. the right to vote, were white people right. and blacks were denied. Right. And now we have this ahistorical, con this colorblind jurisprudence that mm -hmm. is very, very harmful and is yeah. now being weaponized against indigenous peoples everywhere around this country. Right. And unless you fall into a very narrow category, mm -hmm. like fe a federally, re federally recognized Indian tribe, it's right. so hard to get that protection. And you know this because mm -hmm. that is a constant debate in Hawaii, which came into very sharp focus surrounding the debate about the passage of the Akaka Bill. Right. I'm done, that was a very <laughs> long answer, but I think it's important, especially for the students and law students yes. to see how the law is used and wielded and branded as a sword, Yes, you know? And this is 
terribly important. And we have to teach all of our, our law students that. Well, and that's why I asked about it. I think yeah. it's so important for us to unpack Davis versus Guam and look past the words that are written on the paper and really understand how things go down in the courts of the colonizer because that's what's really at stake. And I feel like with so much of this jurisprudence, it's really being turned on its head, whether that's in Rice versus Cayetano for Native Hawaiians, whether that's Davis versus Guam for well, um, your well, people. And so- Or even Tuawa versus United States for American Samoan people. Right. All of this, these are sort of like shenanigans. Right. You know, I, I call them, these cases, like legal mischief. <laughs> it's just a, essentially a, run, a workaround, a way to sort right. of deploy these constitutional amendments in a really like spectacularly dangerous fashion. Right. You know, and I think it's just important that we, again, solidarity is okay. one of the words we, we need to understand hmm. the bar across all of these jurisdictions, Absolutely. how people are weaponizing these amendments so we can work together. Absolutely. And that's why I wanted to talk about it tonight. And what I also want to do, because I think it's important for us to be able to continue to have faith in the law, right? Because as indigenous people in particular, um, the law has been really important for us. It hasn't been a silver bullet. It's not perfect, but it's offered the possibility and potential of justice, which for many of us is, you know, more than what we've had um, under living under empire. And so what would you say to law students, even to people in the community about the potential of law? Because um, it hasn't been a particularly hospitable place for us in the courts of the colonizer. So do we still have faith? Do we still engage in the process? You know, what? Oh, for sure. I mean, the answer is we still do it because it's like it's like a spatula. It's like like if you're making an <laughs> omelet, you know, it's still a useful tool. Like it depends on like, who's wielding it. You know, who is the hand of the cook? You know, like this is what what I'm really saying is like the law in some ways needs to be almost like de-romanticized because right. it is just a tool one set of skills right. and one particular kind of vocabulary that can be called upon to fight for justice. It can and it is every day right. by so many entities. You know, like we, like we last week, I, you don't know this because it's not really, we didn't come out with a press release, but last week our firm partnered with the ACLU mm -hmm. of Puerto Rico and the Center for Constitutional Rights, mm -hmm. filed a joint submission, a shadow report under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Mm -hmm. So essentially we are approaching the Human Rights Committee, right. really alleging and detailing the ways in which the US government continues to deny the right to self-determination in both Puerto Rico and Guam. Right. But just because we believe in it, because like even if it's limited, it's right. still really, really practical. It delivers really concrete sort of results, at least in certain instances. Right. Um, like we recently won another lawsuit under the Endangered Species Act, where we were able to protect, we sued the Fish and Wildlife essentially, to force them to designate critical habitat mm -hmm. under the ESA for at least for a number of species, mm -hmm. native endemic to Micronesia, Guam right. included, and we want that. And right. so it's not as if it's not ever, you know? Right. It's just so often the villain, but sometimes <laughs> it can be the hero, sometimes. Right. Right. But it depends who the lawyer is. Well, absolutely, you know? yeah. And you know, I talk about that a lot um, in the context of Native Hawaiian law and how mm. the law can be a sword or a shield, mm, mm. Um, but it really depends on who's wielding it. Yeah. Um, and I wanna talk more about the work that you're doing at Blue Ocean because I think it's so important. I mean, to me, the heart of the work that you're doing, regardless of what the fora is, is about justice. And, um, you know, our Pacific nations have faced so many different threats. You've talked about issues around self-determination, you know, about, you know, lifting the veil of settler colonialism. But tell us a little bit about why your work on self-determination and really your work around nuclear testing is so important. Okay, <laughs> yeah, another no, really big question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I wanna um, know. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, I don't know how else to say this other than the most categorically legitimate longing of human beings is the longing to be free. Right. That is what self-determination is about at its core. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we are trying to throw off the colonial yoke. Why? Because humanity got together at some point in time and shared a mutual belief. And that is that colonialism is an evil that needs to be rooted out of the world. That is very clear. And honestly, self-determination more than any other norm of international law has more liberatory heft. Mm -hmm. It is singularly responsible for the liberation of so many people in what are now countries. Like, look at the, how many flags we have. We, we have because self-determination was a right that captured the international legal imagination post-World War II. 
We had very few countries. That's why, you know, there's so few of them in 1945 in San Fran signing the thing. And now we have all of these countries. And now they're still granted. The problems are still there. They metastasi metastasize over time. They change. It's, you have to just keep your sort of, you have to keep your eye on it. Be because the ways in which empire is clever, mm -hmm. you know, it's, are, are endless. You know, mm -hmm. the ways in which... Um, empire sort of like deepens its sophistication around subjugation mm -hmm. is something we have to be very, very clear about. For example, like even now, Pacific Island countries are fighting tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. They fought tooth and nail to get 1.5 in the text right. of the Paris Agreement, right? right? Granted, it's, you know, not, not in a, it's not nearly enough. It's not in a, a binding article that established that clear do's and don'ts. It's mm -hmm. not, I don't even know. I'm using this example because it, you can follow the, you can trace the rights over time. Mm -hmm. Then they fought tooth and nail to establish a loss and damage facility, which also took way too long. Right. And now we finally have a loss and damage facility. And that is, you know, to, to put to real monetary, at least monetary compensation, right, right? For certain communities for whom they're already so much on the front lines that right. the normal climate justice stuff doesn't work is not it's insufficient right. so they need a facility but now there's no money in it so right. we now are in another boat like and that's how how it is you know mm -hmm. like pacific island countries are constantly you know like on the front line the front line communities when it comes to the suffering the right. adverse impacts of climate change but they're also Frontline communities, when it comes to devising the solutions right. to that crisis, Vanuatu is just one country. It's an honor to work with them because right. they see so clearly the game, the right. great game afoot, you know, and they fought tooth and nail for this now latest sort of mechanism, this vehicle by which to pursue the hitherto elusive promise mm -hmm. of climate justice. Right. Well, and at bottom, I mean, I have to, I have to, for indigenous people, for so many of us, place and pilina to place mm. is so important because that's what defines who we are as a people. And so we need, and I, I think it's difficult for people to understand why you can't just move or why <laughs> adaptation, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, oh, for sure. you know, there's, it's difficult to be Kanaka anywhere else besides Hawaii because your practices, your life ways exactly. are defined by this place. Exactly. And because we are not satisfied with purely symbolic culture, right? We can't practice our culture like it is an in situ practice, right. you know, it is place based. We right. have ecologically derived customs and languages, right. you know, like, like one of the most compelling stories that I came across in writing my essay to hell with drowning mm -hmm. was the fact that this one village in Fiji was forced to relocate due to, you know, right. um, the inundation brought on by climate change. They were forced to relocate to inland mm -hmm. to higher ground, but they had to leave their dead behind mm -hmm. and they had to, go through the rupture of that of leave, of leaving and so many elderly especially felt sick right. to their stomach about that because they have a duty to their ancestors Absolutely. to care for the graves etc but also they were it's, it's it's like what you're saying it's it's when i say place but we mean in a visceral sense right. and the best way i think arguably to understand that is by way of umbilical cords Absolutely. placenta we yeah. so many pacific people bury their umbil umbilical cords yes. into the ground is in yeah. the earth that that direct visceral connection mm -hmm. you know this is why and, and like in fiji for example vanua the the same mm -hmm. word that means land means people it's like it's a crazy yeah. inseparable thing indigenous right. people from the lands that they live on and that they love you know, right. and to be the rupture of having to prepare to be to lose that all, right. you know, like Tuvalu is like a terrifying example right now, mm -hmm. because now there's talk about creating a digital nation of like oh, the gosh. first nation to like have a whole like 3D, like online digital rendering. I don't even know. <laughs> the point is, nobody knows. Right. These are like nobody knows and we can't know. But that I mean, there are things that we do know. And that is you cannot recreate an ethos a right. worldview and it's a particular worldview that's been reared on a particular piece of soil of right. this earth right. you know and that is singular and unduplicated and we cannot recreate it in a digital world there's enough to know that that project is not one that will work right you know and we know that you know and, and that's why we feel so deeply because right. we love so deeply and that's mm -hmm. why so many people in frontline communities think we will not be moved Right. They're saying that they're holding on. Mm -hmm. Some islands, like they, they refuse. I mean, some yeah. communities are already like, no, stop talking to us. We will go down with this ship. Right. And it's like a very hardcore ride or die, love to the very <laughs> end thing. And right. but some of us are in that boat. And I it, get it. Yeah. 
I get it. I mean, because right, our, our connection for us, it's family. It goes much deeper than that. I mean, to to talk about the picor, the umbilical cord, mm -hmm. it's what tethers us and help us find our place in this universe. Yeah. And so where else can we be? Yeah. And you know, in that way, we're not really unlike turtles or right. unlike all these other incredible other than human species, you know, who know where home is right. and they can geolocate their way there. You know, <laughs> like we are we are just sort of not so different. Like we have this primal longing for home and we're always like home going, mm -hmm. you know, so to be asked to leave, especially by arrogant international financial like institutions who have no right. sense of place. It, yeah. These are mutually irreconcilable differences. Yeah, and I see these issues around self-determination, around the climate crisis, um, just coming home to roost here in Hawaii and on Maui in particular. I mean, we see the same issues around plantation disaster capitalism and that in the wake of the incredible tragedy that is the fires that you know ravaged mm -hmm. Maui Komohana or Lahaina, um, that we see people and companies in particular using this as an opportunity to you know, take even more resources from incredibly vulnerable communities. And so I think the climate crisis and these struggles for self-determination are taking so many different forms, mm. whether it's here in Hawaii, whether it's in Vanuatu, whether it's in Tuvalu, um, and all of us are connected as community. It's so it's, it's, it'll be the challenge, I guess, is to find the way forward um, together. Yeah. No, I mean, it's this the defining, you know, challenge of our time, mm -hmm. you know, and so we need to be more rigorous, you know, than we have ever been mm -hmm. um, to find a way forward. And we have to know, too, that it's not primarily through law, it's through culture, it's through this very fundamental, almost tectonic plate mm -hmm. level shift, you know, in the way we even relate to each other, mm -hmm. the way we rediscover relationality. I mean, it's going to require a very deep radical transformation, right? To get to a regenerative economy, right. to get to a relational as opposed to transactional way of being mm -hmm. in the world. Um, but I think indigenous peoples have a lot to say in that specific regard. That is why at Blue Ocean Law, we are so committed, mm -hmm. perhaps more than any other th idea, we're ideologically bound right. to this notion that indigenous peoples have part of the answer Absolutely. to the question of how to get out of the planetary mess that we're in, yeah. and that why our, our role, however limited, is yeah. to find ways to provide maximum legal protection so that they can thrive in their ancestral spaces, because they are giving us the best shot. That's yep. probably how I would summarize my firm in a <laughs> sentence, but yeah, that's what we believe. Well. And I totally agree, of course. I mean, I think being in a place for a millennia or several has its benefits, right? And all of that incredible place-based biocultural knowledge that we have, whether you want to call it biocultural knowledge, whether you mm -hmm. want to call it traditional ecological knowledge, being able to thrive somewhere for a millennia is what gives us hope for the future. But we need to, going forward means looking back. And we have to be grounded in these indigenous principles. Things like aloha aina, it's common sense, right? I mean, this is not rocket science. It's really just looking to our core, to our pico again, to, to help ground us and the work going forward. So um, given our time, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your writing. You know, your political writing really has a generosity of spirit to it. Um, and you extend empathy across almost every divide. Um, and so I'm curious how this style reflects on your own um, perception of the role of anger kind of in social movements and whatever you want to call it, you know, being fierce, anger, what have you. Um, but do you think that that passion, if we call it that, in anti-colonial movements has a role? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God, without question. I mean, Hanani Kietras probably is like, a living embodiment of that. What did she say? May the bridges I burn light my way or something. Some <laughs> fabulous quote. I mean, you know, I'm totally butchering it right now. But she, she, to me, she's just the embodiment of that. I mean, it's the same. It's a Malcolm X spirit. It's, um, it's like a Fannie Lou Hamer spirit. There's so many, you know, right. warriors over time, over cultures, over spaces, I mean, you know, that I really look to. And I think that is absolutely a vehicle. You know, it's a carriage, mm -hmm. you know, and it will take us far. Right. But it well, I don't believe like alone it can take us all the way. Like there has to be some kind of return, you know, some kind of like 
I don't know how to say this other than even when I do my work, whether it's law or whether mm -hmm. I'm like going so squarely and fiercely against an adversary, like there is a part of me that understands that mm -hmm. like I have other in work to do and that work is interior. Mm -hmm. I have to find a way to keep my heart from hardening mm -hmm. because we need each other. Like I'm not interested in a future without people in it. Like right. we can't just cancel each other to death. Right. Like, I mean, you know, we have right. to find, like I, don't, like I think it was Adrienne Marie Brown, right? She said like, yes, call people out for clear things, but also call people in. You know, like, how do we do that? And I try to think the book is like that. I mean, in some ways, I'll, I'll describe it like this, the difference of the types of writing I do. As a lawyer, uh, the kind, the, how I understand language is cultivating the cold precision of an assassin's bullet. You know, that's what our daughter wrote, how she would say it, our daughter wrote. But when you're writing as a writer, you're trying to build a fire. Mm. You're trying to warm up as many bodies as possible. That is entirely different as an enterprise because it is deeply and radically loving, right. present, open-hearted, you know, and that is hard work to do, but I believe that that work has to be done too, or we're not right. gonna get where we think we're going or hope to go. Right. Yeah. I guess what I would ask also is, the work is hard. I mean, look at <laughs> yeah. what you do. Yeah. Um, look at what we all do. Justice work, movement work, it's incredibly hard. And so what would you say to all of those little brown girls and little brown boys out there, right, who need hope to keep mm. going? What would you say to light their fire? God, so many, it depends on which group of young people, but for like young, um, like indigenous, like Pacific Islanders, I would just be like, for Micronesians, my own people in particular, you know, like take faith in something Apelli Hawafa said, you know, mm. that smallness is a state of mind, mm. that you are so much more powerful than you believe than you have been taught to believe. You know, like we traversed incredible amounts of oceanic space, you know, because we memorized everything. We committed right. to memory, right. like the almost like impossibly vast knowledge systems of sea swells and stars and all of that. We come from such a rich intellectual even tradition, right. you know, of, of being sort of in the community with all of that life, you know, to be able to make, to pull something like that off, the sheer scale mm -hmm. of wayfinding, you know, like, I, so that's what I would encourage them to do, to draw from that well, you know, to like figure, like look inward and see what like sort of values mm -hmm. are embedded in these like sort of cultural teachings and certain cultural protocols of what values are embedded there mm -hmm. and use as much, take as much as you can right. from the old and bring it into the new. Mm -hmm. And also to understand that the, we are facing new problems right. and they are going to require new solutions. So everything we have, we can bring the best of our insights forward mm -hmm. and they will still be insufficient because now with this globalized community is globalized. Right. We live in the world as it actually is, not as we wish it to be. Right. Meaning we're going to have to learn how to work with others. We have to cross pollinate in a profound sense, right. you know? And I think if they understand that, I think would allow them to cultivate their own hope. I mean, hope is something that is earned. Right. That's the other thing, it's not prescribed. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't write them or say them anything. But if I, by the light of my own life, can turn something on in them, if I can point them in the direction of some beauty, I will have done my job. And I think you have. <laughs> <laughs> you. In your book, you include a poem about a rugged flower native to Guam that mm -hmm. flourishes in the most unlikely and difficult circumstances. Um, might you spill a little bit of tea on it or perhaps sure, read it for I'll, us? Maybe I'll just read it. It's Please? just so short. It's, it's like ridiculously short, but it's one of my favorite entries in mm -hmm. the book, actually. Okay. And mine. Okay. Um, Gausali is the name of the flower and the name of this poem. Um, and in the footnote, it reads, Gausali is dedicated to Judy Wampat who tried to change the official flower of Guam from the invasive bougainvillea to the native Gausali and was mocked for it. So much hope for the future rests in a return to the right flower, to Gausali, torchwood of the sea, whose square white flowers cling to no one but the rugged limestone cliffs at the island's edge, whose wood warms us whose wood will light our way again. Thank you, Thank Julian. You.
Any closing but not worth thoughts? You know, it's just, it's been an honor. I'm happy to be back and sitting with you, breaking bread with you. It's always a pleasure. As it is for me. Thank you so much, Julian. Mahalo piha for being with us today, Julian. I'm grateful for your work, your commitment, your spirit, your bravery, and for your holding space and being a role model for all the little brown girls and little brown boys to see what's possible. I also want to mahalo our sponsors who helped to make Julian's visit possible. In addition to everyone at the University of Hawaii, Kamehameha Schools, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii and Palmyra, the Halekulani Hotel, and more. Finally, mahalo to you for watching and for listening today. Ahai pono ike ala kukui me kahuli au. May we all pursue the path of enlightenment through justice. Ahui ho. Thank you.